hopefully we can all come out of this knowing more about bees and how we can actually save the bees. So here's my outline that I want to try, I'll try to stick to. So first, what is a bee? Obviously, there's, there's, uh, it's hard to tell what a bee is. So we'll first talk about bees versus flies, and I'll give you some tips on how to tell the difference. Uh, then bees versus wasps. Wasps, I didn't enunciate that. Um, those are trickier, but we can talk about some of the differences there. Then I want to talk about a bee's life. We have a lot of uh, facts floating around our head that we associate with bees. And so we're going to talk about those facts and see if they hold true for all the bees. And then we'll talk briefly about why we care about bees. You probably also already know why we care about bees, but we'll talk about it, talk about their pollination services, and then how to attract bees to our yard. So that's kind of where we're going to go today. And then there'll be time for questions afterwards. If you have a question in the, in the meantime, we can try it, but it might be best afterwards. So what is a bee? That is a bee. That's the bee that most people think about. That's the honeybee. I call it the European honeybee, differentiating it from our native bees. So you'll hear me say during this presentation, native bee, uh, sometimes I say wild bee, and sometimes I say solitary bee, but we'll get to that. The European honeybee isn't from here. It's not from North America, it's from Europe. That's why it's called the European honeybee. Uh, it was brought over to pilgrims long ago when pilgrims came here. Uh, so it's not native to the U.S., but in the last several hundred years, it is fairly well established. Here. But people don't recognize that there's lots of other kinds of bees. Uh, this is one of my favorites, this little gal right there, sitting on a quarter. So there's really small bees, there's really big bees, there's red bees, red bees, and blue bees, and green bees, uh, and wasp-like bees. Lots of different kinds of bees. In fact, about 4,000 species in North America. So, a lot of kinds of bees. It's hard to imagine 4,000, uh, but there's a lot out there. So, let's do a little quiz here. So, we know that bees are hard to tell apart from other things. In this picture, these are all images of bees, flies, and wasps. So, we'll start up here on this top left corner. Which one of those two insects is a bee? This one on the right, or this one on the left? Oh, left. 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 Your left. Oh yeah. <laughs> Your left. This one? Yeah. Yeah. Anyone say this one? Yeah. Okay. Let me circle it for you. That is the bee. And all these other ones. Uh, so this is a bumblebee. This is a fly. Oops, I should have said that. I wasn't asking. So this is a fly, but it looks like a bumblebee. This is hard to tell, right? So why do bees Flies and wasps look so similar. So any idea why bees and flies would look the same? It's like mouth and stuff. Protection, right? Mimicry. So a fly doesn't sting. Bees, bees do sting. So if the fly looks like a bee, it's less likely to be eaten by predators. So through evolutionary time, it, it uh, involves that same color pattern. So it mimics the bees in the same area. What about flies between bees and wasps? Why might they look the same? Yeah, they're the same group, right? They're close, they're close relatives of each other. So let's look at this is the family tree of wasps. Bees are down here at the bottom, we have ants, and then we have a bunch of different kinds of wasps. So we're not going to go to the details, but suffice it to say that bees are cousins of wasps. They're cousins, and so they look pretty similar to wasps. So they can be hard to tell apart. But bees and flies aren't that closely related. And so let's first look at, at those two. So we have a bee here. We have a fly here. What's the difference? How do you tell the difference between a bee and a fly? The antenna is a really good thing to look for. These bees have long ones, the fly doesn't, right? Another thing to look for is pollen collecting hairs. Bees often have big hairy back legs to carry pollen. Flies usually don't. Their head, for me when I'm looking, uh, I look at their face. So you said the antennas. Bees have long ones, flies have short ones. Also, if you look at the eyes, the fly's eyes are filling most of its head. The bee's eyes are kind of uh, regular shaped eyes. That's what I, I think of as regular shaped. But they're not filling the whole head, right? So if you see in your yard, you see something buzzing around a flower, you can usually tell if it's a bee or a fly because of the head. Uh, also, flies only have two wings, bees have four wings. It's hard to tell if it's flying or if it's running around on a flower because the bee's four wings get pulled it up. Um, so there are some some pretty distinct physical differences between flies and bees. Um, while these flies will buzz around flowers, they're not bad for the flowers. Um, some of them will pollinate some. Uh, their larvae sometimes eat aphids. So they're not bad insects to have around, but they're not as efficient pollinators as the bees are. So 
Now that we're experts on bees versus flies, can you spot the flies? Instead of these ones, we know that one's a fly. Let's look at the top right. We have three insects there. Which ones are flies? One in the middle? One on the right? Is that a bee or a fly? How about on this one? Okay, how about that one? You are right. So those are the flies. So again, look at those antennas. See how small the flies' antennas are? And the bees are longer? You can't really see in this image uh, kind of dark, but the, the eyes are really big here, and the eyes are not as big on the bee. Uh, so, flies versus bees, we're all right with that. What about fly, uh, bees versus wasps? So, we have three wasps, and we have that same bee down in the corner. How do you tell the difference? Wasps don't have hairy legs. Wasps don't have hairs, have you said? Hairy legs? Yeah, anything else? Voice. The body, what did you say? Yeah, the abdomen. The abdomen, yeah. So wasps often have these skinny little waists. Um, wasps often have skinny legs. And often with these kind of thorn, thorny looking projections on it. So skinny legs, skinny waists, uh, not very much hair. The bee often is hairy, has the big hairy legs. Uh, so there's some differences, but there's a problem with those. Those, are, those work pretty good, but there's a problem with this picture. So these are all bees. We have our hairy, normal looking bee, and then we have these ones that look a lot like wasps. Skinny waves, not very much hair, skinny legs. So what do you do? If these are all bees, we need to learn how to tell them apart, right? Well, scientists use a character that is not very useful. Uh, we look at their hairs under a microscope. Well, actually, you don't have to every time, but once you get used to it. But the, the only really bad characteristic to separate, physical characteristic to separate bees from wasps is bees have, we call them plumose hairs, or branch hairs. So if you look closely at these hairs, they almost look a little bit fuzzy. It kind of like if you look at a feather, how there's a main shaft in the feather, the little plumes coming off. That's what's happening on these hairs. If you could zoom in even farther, you can see that those hairs are plumes. They're branch hairs. So somewhere on every bee's body, there will be some branch hairs. This is not a really hairy bee, but all the hairs are branched. Um, even the bees that look a lot like wasps, so this is a bee, this one's a wasp. Uh, this is so, just to orient where we're looking at. This is the head of the bee, the head of the wasp, and this is kind of its shoulder area. So there's this yellow plate, well, I Photoshop to make everything not yellow except for that. This yellow plate on the bee is surrounded by these plumose hairs, these branch hairs. That same yellow plate on the wasp has simple hairs, there's no branching. That's not very useful if you're in your garden and you want to know if this is a bee or a wasp. You can't really see the plumose hairs very well. So physically, they look pretty much the same. But behaviorally, they're pretty different. So it has to do with their diet. Bees are herbivores. They eat pollen and nectar. Wasps are carnivores. They eat meat, including bugs. So this is a Katie the best wasp is, has killed and is eating, or is taking it back to its babies. So when you're eating your barbecue in your backyard, and the quote bees are flying around bothering you, they're probably not bees. Bees don't care about your hamburger, but wasps do. And in fact, if you sit there and let that wasp land on your hamburger, it will do the same thing. It will cut out a little piece of your hamburger, and it will fly away and bring it back to its babies, and get its sisters to come back for one. So it's the, the wasps usually at your barbecue that are, that are bugging you. So because of this behavior, this, this dietary preferences, bees are gonna spend a lot more time in the flowers because they're actively gathering the pollen and the, ne and the nectar. And wasps, while they go to flowers, they drink the nectar too, kind of like their energy drink. They're not going to spend as much time in the flower itself. Sometimes you'll see the wasps flying up and down the stem or looking at the leaves, looking for caterpillars to eat. Um, so you can kind of tell the difference based on what it's doing. Also, because of the predatory nature and the herbivorous nature, wasps are mean. And bees generally are not as mean. So, there are some, some, some ways to tell them apart. Uh, so now let's talk about bees. We want to talk about the bees' life, life, not life cycle, but just this lifestyle. What does it do? And so, there's some misconceptions about what, what bees do. Most of the time, when you ask somebody about a bee, they'll think of one of these three things. Bees live in hives, bees make honey, or bees sting you once and they die. You've probably heard those things, right? So those are all true facts for that bee, the honey bee. It lives in lives, it makes honey, and it dies after it stings you once. What about all the other bees in North America? Are these facts true? Well, let's go through each one and talk about it. 
So first, these live in hives. We've learned, depending on your generation, various cartoon bears have taught us that bees live in these kind of paper mache nests. They dangle from branches like that, and there's honey inside. Right? Have you guys seen these kind of paper mache bags? I've seen them, I've had them in my trees. Uh, that's not where bees live. In fact, none of those are bees. There's no bee that makes a paper nest. There are paper nests out there, the ones that look kind of like honeycombs under your deck, or those ones that are kind of enclosed in a paper mache bag. These are both wasp nests. Paper wasps or yellow jackets will make that kind of nest, hornets will make that kind of nest. So if Winnie the Pooh went to this nest and ripped it open, there would be no honey, just lots of angry wasps. Honeybees make big, big nests, a big hive, and they make honey, but they don't surround it by paper. So this is an abandoned honeybee nest in the Mojave Desert. Honeybees like to nest in cavities, so in hollow trees, this is a cavity in a cliff, and so they'll make their nest in that cavity, which just consists of wax combs with bees on it. So sometimes Winnie the Pooh would find honey inside a tree. That was true, just not the paper ones. But do most bees live like this? Well, no, they don't. So we know they're not a paper mache. We know they're not a big hive. Where do most bees live? Well, almost all of the bees in North America are solitary, and most of them nest in the ground. So they're solitary ground nesting bees. What does it mean? Solitary, they're living by themselves. There's no queen, there's no workers, there's no hives. It's just a single bee that digs a hole in the ground and makes her nest in there. So the top of the hole can be surrounded by kind of a, a little ant hill, a mound of dirt. Sometimes it can just be a hole, just a bare hole in the ground. And some bees make little chimneys out of the top of their nest. We're not exactly sure why, but there's some chimneys in that nest. So under the, that surface that we can see, Usually there's a long tunnel going straight down, anywhere between a couple inches to a couple feet. Uh, some researchers from Utah State were digging up one of these nests out in Utah and it went, I think, nine feet down. So like a half an inch long bee dug nine feet for some reason, we don't know why. Uh, and then at the bottom of this long tunnel, they'll put little rooms off. So in each of these rooms, they put nectar and pollen, kind of make it into a little ball, and they'll lay an egg on it. So inside that, I don't know, here's a, a photograph of what that looks like, and call that a pollen loaf. It's just nectar and pollen mixed together. The pollen provides the protein for the growing baby, and the, the nectar has some of the carbohydrates that it needs. Some bees do kind of a more of a solid pollen loaf, mostly pollen. Other bees, like this bee, is kind of like a pollen soup, mostly nectar with some pollen mixed in it. So that's what is at the bottom of these ground nesting bee holes. That's how most bees live. Uh, there's other bees that don't nest in the ground, but they still nest in holes. We call these cavity nesting bees or twig nesting bees. So most of these bees don't dig their own nest, they don't chew into a, a piece of wood. They'll just find a pretty existing hole and fly in and make their hole out of it. This one has a hole, this one has a crack in the log. Either way, they, they go into that and then they remodel it. They use wallpaper to line it and they might smooth it out a little bit with their, by chewing on the walls. And so, inside this, this pre-existing hole, this is a, a hollow stem of, I think that one's an elderberry maybe. Uh, so the, the stems of elderberries or raspberries are kind of picky, and they can chew out that pith, they just won't chew any hard wood. So they don't make any rooms off, like branching rooms, like the ground nesting bees. Instead, they just make a series of rooms, and they'll put pollen and nectar in that one, lay an egg, and move on to the next one, with a little partition in between. Most of these bees will line their nest with leaves, kind of like wallpaper. So they go to a leaf, they'll cut out a little piece, they'll fly back to the nest with that piece of a cut leaf, and they'll line their nest with it. So you might see evidence of leaf cutter bees in your yard, and it looks kind of scary. This is my grandma-in-law. She had a lilac bush, uh, and it was all chewed up, it looked like. So she was worried that there was caterpillars or grasshoppers, something damaging her lilacs. And it was leaf cutter bees. There's some damage there, right? You can't say that that's a healthy lilac tree. But they're not actively feeding on it. They're just using it for wallpaper. So it shows that she has a very healthy population of leaf cutter bees in her yard. Um, so let's review here. Where do bees live? They're not in paper mache bags. They're not in big hives. Most bees are solitary, and most of them nest in the ground. So if we don't recognize that, then we might be making a lot of steps to save bees, these hive bees, and we'll not realize that there's a lot of ground nesting bees that also need our attention, potentially. Uh, what do bees eat? So we know from these same cartoon bears that bees eat honey. But in fact, that's only true for the honeybee. 
So out of those 4,000 species in North America, one of them makes honey, and it's the one that's from Europe. None of our native bees make honey. So what do they eat? What do they feed their babies? Well, we know they feed their babies pollen and nectar. And actually, as adults, they also eat pollen and nectar. Their pollen gives them their protein, and nectar gives them their carbohydrates. So larvae, that's a bee larva, eating pollen and nectar, the adult eating pollen and nectar. So there's no honey involved in this. Uh, because they're, they're eating pollen and nectar, they spend most of their time on flowers. We've talked a little bit about that behavior. I just wanted to show some pretty pictures of bees on flowers. Um, <laughs> So there's some interesting, interesting um, characteristics of bees' diets that a lot of people don't recognize or realize. Um, oops, I'm getting ahead of myself. So as they're on the flower, they have evolved specialized um, mechanisms to collect the pollen more efficiently. Certain flowers have big pollen grains, other flowers have small pollen grains. It's located in different spots on the flower. So different bees have evolved different ways to carry pollen. This is a bee that uh, likes to go to cactuses. Cactuses have really big pollen grains compared to some other plants, and these bees have really big, thick bristles on their back legs to carry those cactus pollen. Uh, there's a whole family of bees that doesn't carry pollen on its legs, it carries it under its abdomen. So if you can see the pollen under the abdomen on a bee in your yard, you know it's a leaf cutter bee or one of its relatives. So they have these specialized hairs for carrying pollen. Uh, a lot of bees actually are picky eaters, and this is what I was going to say when I was getting ahead of myself. Honeybees will go to any flower that they see. They'll go to your dandelions, they'll go to your, your apple tree, they'll go to your rose bush. Um, it makes honeybees pretty good at, at generalized pollination. A lot of bees are specialists, meaning that they have a, a strong preference for certain kinds of plants. This, for example, is called a squash bee, and she only visits squash plants. And that includes pumpkins and cucumbers and zucchinis and the wild squashes. So, but she'll only go to the squash flowers. Other bees are, are generalists like the honeybee. So this is a metallic green sweat bee, and it goes to lots of different kinds of flowers. So we have strict specialists, we have broad generalists. Uh, most bees are somewhere in between. They eat a variety of kinds of, I mean, they'll visit a variety of kinds of flowers, but they prefer one kind. This is a longhorn bee, and it will visit lots of flowers, but it's most often collected on sunflowers or sunflower family flowers, so daisies and things like that, especially like sunflowers. Though. And so, if we don't recognize the specific dietary preferences of different bees, and we only focus on honeybees by planting fields of clover and lavender, we might not be doing very much for the, the wild bees that live in the area. And so it helps to, to first recognize that there's different dietary preferences, and then as we learn about the bees, we can get to know what their diet is, and make efforts to provide for them. Oh, I tell people this, and they often say, oh, it's kind of cool, but they don't really pollinate very much, right? And so for some reason, there's this, this thought that honeybees are the pollinators, these other bees are not. And they are pollinators. In fact, they're really good pollinators. Sometimes much better pollinators than honeybees. So this is 100 honeybees, and the studies have shown that the work that 100 honeybees can do in, in fruit orchards can be done by two mason bees. Sometimes more, sometimes 100 to 1. And so, mason bees can be a lot more efficient pollinators of some of our fruit crops than honeybees can. The difference is that honeybees can be trucked around from Florida to California to the fruits when they're, when they're blooming. Uh, a lot of the wild bees aren't as easy to move around, especially if they're nesting in the ground, right? Um, but they are pollinators, and some of them are much more efficient pollinators. There's a whole other category of bees that we often ignore because we like to talk about the good, nice, sweet bees. Uh, there's this kind of bee, there's this group of bees called pollen bees. They're actually officially called kleptoparasites. So klepto is stealing, and parasite is they're parasitic bees. They're 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 the mean bees. So none of these bees dig their own nest. None of these bees collect any pollen. What they do is they hang around either by flowers or around nesting sites, and they find their preferred host, usually a different kind of bee, and when that bee is gone, they'll sneak into the bee's nest, the hole in the ground, into that little room at the bottom of the nest with the pollen and the nectar in it. They'll lay their egg and hide it in that room, and then fly away. So then when the, when the host bee is finished provisioning the nest for its babies, its baby hatches to eat its pollen, and then that releases some hormones to cue into that egg to hatch. 
The baby pollen thief will kill the host baby and eat the pollen that was left for it. So not all bees are nice and friendly, but they're still really cool. Uh, so in the spring, you, you will see some uh, mining bees. It's this, this broad group, group of bees. But you'll also see some of the parasites of the mining bees. They look a lot like wasps. And in fact, they act a lot more like wasps, right? They don't, as adults, they still eat pollen and nectar, but they have harder, harder skin than a lot of bees to protect them. They have less hair than a lot of bees. And so, uh, to me, they're some of the coolest looking bees, but they're not what we're used to thinking about bees as. So, we've talked about bees don't live in hives, we've talked about bees don't make honey. What about this thing about bees stinging you once before they die? This used to be a, a, one of my preferred facts when I was a little kid, because I would periodically get stung by bees as I was walking around barefoot. And I would say, well, think to myself, well, at least it died after it's done. And I thought it was some revenge, you know, for it stinging me, at least it died. But what, what about all the other bees? Can they sting you more than once? So before we can talk about that, I thought we should talk about what the stinger actually is. Um, so the stinger is a modified ovipositor. Ovipositor means egg layer. Ova is egg, and positor is kind of like a layer. So a lot of insects have these, like, these egg layers. This is a cricket like from the pet store. Uh, often you see this little black kind of spiky thing sticking out the back of the cricket. That's its egg layer. It's its ovipositor. Uh, Katie did and Mormon crickets, they have those too. They have these, these ovipositors. Um, because only females can lay eggs, only females have these egg layers, these ovipositors. Bees and wasps and ants, they don't lay eggs out of their ovipositor anymore. It has been modified to become a stinger. So instead of laying eggs out of it, they inject venom out of it. And so that's why it hurts, because they're sticking a poison. They now lay, lay eggs out of a little hole near the base of the stinger called an ovipore, which means egg hole. <laughs> so, the stinger is a modified ovipositor. Because only females can lay eggs, only females have this modified ovipositor, and only females can sting. So, all the bees that you see, if it stung you, it was a girl. <laughs> Boys can't sting. Same with wasps, the same with ants. So, why do these wasps, bees, and ants have these modified ovipositors? Well, most wasps use it to hunt. It's their weapon to, to immobilize their prey. This is a spider wasp. She feeds exclusively on spiders, and she will find the spider, sting it a bunch of times to paralyze it, and then drag it back to her nest, lay an egg on it, so its baby can eat a freshly paralyzed meat. Uh, so most wasps are using that ovipositor, that modified ovipositor, to immobilize their prey. Bees' food doesn't need to be immobilized, right? They don't need to sting the flower and make it give pollen out. So why do they have sting? Any ideas? For protection. So a lot of bees, especially the social bees like honeybees, they have their stinger and it works pretty efficiently. Oh, I just realized I say things interchangeably. I say sting because officially geek entomologists call it a sting. It's a verb and a noun. Uh, and a stinger is not an official entomological term. So if I say a sting, I'm usually meaning it as a noun. <laughs> uh, but I'm trying to say stinger. Uh, my colleague will get mad at me if I say that, but honeybees are, have effective stingers. And when they have thousands of individuals in a colony, it can be a really effective defense. If you bug this colony of honeybees, a lot of them will come out and sting you, and you will run away. So it works really well when you're social. But when you're a solitary bee, most of these bees native to North America do have stingers, and they are capable of stinging, but most of the time it's not worth their, their effort. Uh, so they, they probably won't sting. So, the thing about them stinging, stinging you once and they die, it's true for honeybees. Honeybees sting you once when they move away, or likely as you brush them away, their stinger stays in your body, and it kind of, uh, we'll say it mortally wounds them as, it, as they get pulled away from it. It's attached to a lot of their vital organs, and it, it, it makes them die. Uh, stinger, the stinger of a honeybee has little barbs on it. If you look close, it's, it's kind of like a little harpoon. So it's designed to stay in when they sting. Other bees, like the bumblebee, has more of a straight needle-like stinger. So a bumblebee can sting you, but it can sting you multiple times. It doesn't die when it stings you. In fact, the only bee that stings you once and dies is the honeybee. And they can do this because there's tens of thousands of workers in this colony, so if you, use, if you lose a couple hundred of them stinging a bear or a person, 
uh, it's not going to affect the, the health of the colony. Solitary bees, they don't want to die, and so it's not worth it to, it's not worth it to sting you, first of all, unless they really need to. But most of the time, they're so busy digging their nest, collecting pollen for their nest, and, and provisioning their nest, they're not going to bother with you. I was laying, so this is a, a bunch of nests of this kind of bee, all these little chimneys of the nest holes. I was probably five inches away from these nests as I was taking pictures, and they would just fly in and out and, and not, not care at all. They're much more docile. So, moral of the story, bees can sting you lots of times if they want to, but most of the time they don't. When I have been stung, it's either because I have one stuck you know, up in my shirt sleeve or something and it thinks that it's in danger, or I'm catching bees and I put my hand in the net and accidentally grab it or something. So it's, it's pretty difficult to make a bee sting you because it doesn't really care to sting you that often. For most of the bees. Honeybees are different, they have a little bit more of aggressive tendencies. So why do we care about bees? Well, the obvious reason is pollination. So this is a thing I stole from the internet. I can't remember who originally made it, I should look that up. This is a produce section in a grocery store with bees. And then I'll click the button and it'll show what that same produce section will look like without bees. So with bees, lots of good foods, lots of colors and shapes and sizes of fruits and vegetables. Without bees, there's a couple things to eat, right? You have oranges in there, those are like maybe grapefruits. Uh, so there's some food we can eat, but it's not going to be nearly as yummy. So with bees, without bees. Bees are really important pollinators. Um, so there are some estimates that say one in every three bites is, is uh, produced through pollination, insect pollination, and most of that's from bees. So here we've listed a bunch of different foods that we eat. The bigger the font, the more important bees are for those foods. You can see honey has a pretty big hot font because <laughs> you don't get it without bees. Well, you don't get real honey without bees. Uh, camel needs bees, squash needs bees, passion fruit, then there's other things with smaller font, fonts like coconut, quinoa, wait, does that say quinoa? It says something else. Uh, onions, so they, they need pollination, but for example, onions, a lot of the pollination is done by flies instead of bees for some reason. So, a lot of our good foods need bees. There's stuff that you see sometimes on the internet, and you, can, you can't trust everything on the internet. And it says, well, there's one quote from Einstein. Have you ever heard the quote from Einstein about bees? He said, he supposedly said something like, if, if bees died, we would, all of humanity would die in three years, something like that. Einstein never really said that, and as far as I know, Einstein probably didn't know much about bees. But, it sounds cool if you say this, Einstein said this. So you see all these quotes like that that say, if bees disappear, humans would die. It's true that if every bee disappeared, we would have a, a, a less healthy diet, but corn doesn't need bees, it's wind pollinated. Uh, barley and wheat and uh, rice, those are all wind pollinated. So we probably wouldn't die, we would just have to eat a lot of oatmeal without any fruit in it. <laughs> so bees are important, but this, these alarmist kind of things that people spread around, um, they, need, they need a little bit more information. So bees are important for our foods. Undeniable, especially the good foods. They're also important for scenes like that. That is a rare scene in California at foothills when there's flowers. This year it was like that. Um, a lot of the wildflowers we see need bees for pollination. So they need bees to make seeds, and so these nice seeds we get of, of mountain meadows with wildflowers, bees are responsible for that. So bees are good for our food, bees are good for a lot of other things. So they're important pollinators. Uh, I've already mentioned how good um, mason bees can be for crops, but here's just uh, another way to reiterate that. In an acre of apples, uh, it's recommended that you use one hive of honeybees. So one hive, roughly 60,000 bees, it's a lot of bees. That can, with those, that one hive, you can effectively pollinate your acre of apples. Uh, the studies show that you can do the same pollination of that acre of apples with 250 to 300 mason bees. So again, they're really efficient. There's lots of things that make them efficient, lots of different characteristics. Sometimes they work faster, sometimes they can carry more pollen, sometimes they're more specific. The mason bees like uh, flowers in the rose family, so they won't get as distracted. Um, it has been shown that if you have dandelions under your apple orchards, the honeybees often get distracted by the dandelions. And so there's, there's lots of different factors. Um, there's other aspects of, of pollination that makes the wild bees really efficient with certain kinds of flowers. Anyone know what that flower is? This is really zoomed in, just so you know. 
It's a pretty small one. Tomato? It is a tomato, very good. So tomatoes and their relatives. They have kind of unique flowers that their pollen isn't easily accessible. They hold on to their pollen kind of tight. And they only let go of it if the flower gets vibrated at a certain frequency. So we call this buzz pollination because a lot of wild bees or native bees uh, are capable of buzz pollination. What they do is they land on the flower and they can actually detach their wings from their wing muscles so they can vibrate their wing muscles without flying. And so when they do that, they buzz without flapping their wings and it causes the, the flowers to release more pollen. Um, so tomatoes and their relatives need buzz pollination. Uh, blueberries produce a lot more with buzz pollination. A lot of flowers do better with buzz pollination. Honeybees don't have the ability to buzz pollinate. They've just never evolved that ability. So a lot of wild bees do. Um, so tomatoes, for example, are not efficiently pollinated by honeybees. But you can also pollinate your tomatoes by hitting them with your hand, because it's kind of making it release some of the pollen. Or you can buy these sonicators. It looks like a big sonic care toothbrush. And you touch it to your plant and buzz it yourself. Or you can just let the wild bees do it. So buzz pollination makes some of these wild bees much more efficient. So, what about bees in our yard? How can we make efforts to help save the bees? Well, we can alter our landscaping a little bit, and it can provide habitat for bees. So bees need two things, like everything that's alive. They need food, and they need shelter, right? Food and habitat. So to provide food for bees, it's as easy as planting flowers. And I would like to give you a list of flowers, but there's lots of different kinds. In our book, we have separated the, the country into different regions, and we have lists of flowers that are good for different times of year, for different regions. Uh, the rule of thumb is plant lots of different kinds of flowers, and you'll get lots of different kinds of bees. So when I say different kinds, different sizes, and different shapes, and different colors, some bees like yellow flowers, some bees like purple flowers. When I say sizes and shapes, some flowers are kind of sunflower shaped, other flowers are more tubular shaped, like uh, like pea flowers. So the, the more variety of flowers you have, the more variety of bees you can potentially attract. Uh, and then also, oh, and we also want to make sure there's flowers all year round. If you only have flowers in the spring, you'll be helping spring bees. But there's a bunch of other kinds of bees that don't come out until August or September. And so you can, and it looks nice for a yard to have flowers all year round too. I mean, all season. We're not going to have flowers. Um, so planting flowers can help bees. There's some flowers that are less attractive to bees, like roses. Your rose garden looks really nice, but you don't see a lot of bees on it. Uh, in, in general, a lot of the cultivated flowers, the ones with lots of petals that look really pretty, bees don't like them as much. So um, a lot of times people say plant native flowers, and that'll help bees. And it's true, bees do like native flowers because they love them. There's other varieties of flowers that are equally attractive to bees. There's a, a cat bee. It's a, a hybrid between, I don't even know what it's between, a couple of mint plants, I guess, and cattle or something. A lot of bees like that. So, variety of flowers are different bees. In between your flowers, instead of putting round cloth or thick layers of mulch, if you can leave little pieces, little patches of dirt, that provides habitat for the ground nesting bees. So, this bee actually lives in my yard in that dirt right there. And so, it's just a little hole in the ground, it looks kind of like an ant hole or something. But if you sit and watch, you can see the bees coming in and out with their pollen. So leaving patches of dirt is good for bees. Specifically, bees seem to prefer sunny, sunny areas, often south facing or south and east facing, so they get the morning sun. Um, some bees like flat ground. Some bees will nest in hills, so you can take a wheelbarrow full of dirt and dump it, and that can provide habitat for nesting ground nesting bees. And so uh, there are creative ways to landscape with dirt that will provide habitat for bees. But in general, avoid thick layers of mulch or avoid ground cloth, because the bees don't mess through that ground cloth. And they often don't like the mulch. So in my yard, was, where I had the most bees nesting was a spot where my lawn had died. And it was just dirt. So what do you do? Uh, not all bees nest in the ground, though, right? You can provide habitat for these other, these cavity nesting bees in a couple of ways. You can buy nice looking, um, I think they call them bee hotels. <laughs> bee nest boxes. So you can buy those, or you can build your own. A lot of these are just reeds, like Phragmites, which is not a good reed for a uh, weed for us, but you can cut those stems and put them into a, a little nest box, and bees will nest in them. I just took a piece of wood and drilled a bunch of holes in it, and bees nest there. So the, the leaf cutter bees, they don't, like I said, they don't dig their own, they don't chew out their own nests in the wood. They just find pre-existing holes, 
and they nest in it. So bigger holes will attract bigger bees, smaller diameter holes will have to attract smaller bees. Again, they're pretty docile. When I came, took this picture, I was you know a couple inches away from it, and they would just go in and out and, and ignore me. Or my little daughter comes up and watches it, watches our bee hotel, and it's just fun to watch the bees come in and out. So we can provide food and habitat for bees, and it can help us attract bees to our yard, which is good. So how do we save the bees? Well, we talked about those methods, but I think there's a, we need to take a step back and realize the first step in saving the bees is probably to learn about the bees. So I showed this picture on some of my social media sites the other day, and most of the comments I got back was, wow, I had no idea there was this many kinds of bees. And so what this was showing is there's a honeybee, and I think I said on my post, uh, a lot of bees are smaller than honeybees. Because there's a lot of bees that are a lot smaller than honeybees that we don't think about. But it was interesting to me that people were saying, wow, I had no idea there was this many kinds of bees. My, my co-author, Olivia, and I made this poster, Back There Bees in North America. Uh, this has about 130 species of bees on it. So when people say, you see this, they say, wow, that's a lot of kinds of bees. I had no idea there was that many kinds of bees. And it's true. Uh, people don't recognize that. But if I was going to try to show how many bee species really live in North America, we would have to duplicate this poster 30 different times. So that's how many bee species live here. So when we see those 10 bees and think, I didn't know there was that many, that's less than 1% of how many bees really live here. There's a lot of kinds of bees. So uh, a colleague of mine once said this, raising honeybees to save pollinators is like raising chickens to help birds. Uh, when I say that, a lot of times honeybee beekeepers uh, get mad at me. It seems kind of offensive to them. What do you mean my honeybees are like chickens? But let me, let me walk through this, right? I have chickens in my yard, and I like them. And chickens are pretty important birds, right? They feed a lot of people, they're nice pets. So chickens, I'm not saying chickens are bad, and I'm not saying honeybees are bad either, but chickens are very different than a lot of the birds and the needs of a lot of birds, right? Just like honeybees are pretty different, and their needs are really different than a lot of the wild bees. So I stand by this, the quote, raising honeybees to save pollinators is like raising chickens to help birds. The problem is, that's what people know. People know honeybees, so they think, oh, pollinators, we should save them, let's do stuff with honeybees. Like Morgan Freeman, right? He bought 30, 30 beehives to save the bees. He probably didn't realize there was a lot of other ones out there. And in fact, research shows that if you increase the honeybee population too high in an area, then they compete with the native bees and it can have a negative effect on the native bees. Especially if you think about one honeybee hive having 50,000, 60,000 bees, that's a lot of competition for someone's backyard, right? Um, so I, I say, before you can save the bees, you need to get to know the bees. And so how do we do that? Well, there's lots of things we can do. First, recognizing that there's a lot out there, so we can start seeing them in our yard. And I have a little video of how fun bee watching can be. So bird watching is fun, right? It's fun to watch the birds do things. You can watch the crane nesting. It's really cool. There's a video, I mean, a live feed over there, so you don't have to bother birds. But it's fun to watch birds. A lot of people like to watch birds. Watching these can be equally rewarding. So this is a video from my backyard. This is in my zucchini plant. And this is a squash bee. So I'll, I'll narrate the video as we, as we watch it. Please. Undid it. Okay, ready? Go. So female squash bee, she's currently getting nectar down at the base of that flower. As she's walking around, she's also spreading some pollen because she has stuff to her legs. She's grooming herself, so she's cleaning off her face, cleaning off her tongue. Uh, she'll move that pollen that she's grooming off of her onto her back legs. Just again, she wants to bring the pollen back to her neck. So you can see she spends some time grooming. At the end of the video here, a male squash bee will come uh, to court her. And uh, she kicks him off a couple times, and then I think the video ends. But so it's kind of neat because you can actually watch. There's the male comes in, you can see her actively keeping him away. She doesn't want to be bothered right now. Uh, and he's somewhat persistent, and then they fly away. Um, so bee watching can be fun, especially if you find the bee nest. You can just sit there and watch them. Watch them dig the nest is cool. Watch them bring pollen into the nest is cool. Sit on your flowers and see how many different sit on your flowers. Sit by your flowers and see how many different kind of bees come. It's pretty interesting, and it can be pretty rewarding. So again, to save the bees, we should get to know the bees. And so, before I end and take questions, I have to acknowledge people that have helped, right? My, my co-author, Olivia, has done lots of bee stuff with me. Um, she's more of the bee expert than me. 
Uh, USDAP lab is up in Logan. It's associated with the university, with Utah State University, and I worked with them as an undergraduate. I met my wife through them, and now I still work with them a lot. So they help a lot. And of course, my wife and kids, they're my field of help. I have quotes around help, because my kids sometimes want to avoid the flies, or my daughter sometimes get distracted by uh, dance moves, I guess. <laughs> but uh, I guess apparently I'm somewhat smooth when I dance, and that's what's going on. And I also praise the University of the Press and Utah State in Tooele. So with that, oh, and I say one more thing. Uh, if you're interested in social media stuff, we, Olivia and I post stuff somewhat regularly. So Facebook, it's the Bees in Your Backyard. Instagram, the Bees in Your Backyard, with underscores. And then Twitter, it's the Bees Backyard. Or if you look at the Bees in Your Backyard, you would be there too. Um, and then we have a blog which is, has not very much stuff on it. We have our poster for sale on it, and it's beesinyourbackyard.com. I think you can probably also type the beesinyourbackyard.com and it will go there too. So, with that, I'd like to take any questions.